Ocrevus versus rituximab. These are both similar medications to treat MS, which deplete B lymphocytes, the white blood cells that make antibodies. But is one better than the other? Well, they've never been studied head to head, but according to this observational study in relapsing MS, Ocrevus may be better at stopping attacks. I'll give a little background and then we'll look at the data. But I want to start with a conflict of interest statement. My name is Brandon Bieber. I make videos about MS every Wednesday. I'm a neurologist and multiple sclerosis specialist. I don't receive any form of compensation, direct or indirect, by any of the drug companies that makes either Ocrevus or the different formulations of rituximab. Rituximab is an off-patent medication with multiple manufacturers. However, I am a long-term prescriber of rituximab. Some of the mentors I worked with have used it long before Ocrevus was ever available and I've used it for many years and had good results. Also, I tend to be generally skeptical of Me Too drugs. My feeling is a lot of pharmaceutical companies are trying to cash in on proven concepts, often repackaging existing concepts which aren't necessarily superior. That's just my general orientation. So overall, I'm certainly more biased in favor of rituximab. Take that into account when watching this video. So this diagram shows how Ocrevus and rituximab work. This is a cell, a B lymphocyte that produces antibodies. It has a protein on the surface called CD20, and Ocrevus and rituximab are themselves antibodies, Ocrevus depicted here, that bind to this protein and cause the cell to break open and die. And this happens almost instantaneously during the infusion, and afterwards people have often undetectable B lymphocyte counts. However, Ocrevus and rituximab are not exactly the same, even though they're trying to achieve the same thing. For example, Ocrevus is more of a humanized drug. Rituximab is chimeric, meaning it contains both mouse and human proteins, whereas Ocrevus is more humanized, not fully humanized, such as Ofatumumab, the drug that is Casimpta or Arzera. So there can be differences in allergies to these drugs. You could be allergic to one but not the other, and in infusion reactions. Although many of the infusion reactions are actually due to the breakdown of the B cells and the spilling of their contents into the serum rather than the drug itself, so they can occur with any of these drugs, including fully humanized Arzera. The dosing is also different. The standard dosing of Ocrevus is 300 milligrams IV twice two weeks apart, so a total of 600 milligrams, but given in two separate doses, and then 600 milligrams every six months. Now, people have attempted alternative dosing regimens, as we'll discuss later. There's a tendency for people to give these drugs less often to reduce the side effects, particularly with long-term use, because these are immunosuppressants that can cause low levels of antibodies, and in some cases, serious infections. The half-life of Ocrevus is a little bit longer. It's 26 days versus about three weeks with rituximab. Rituximab has been used in various different dosing regimens. The old regimen used to treat rheumatoid arthritis was 1,000 milligrams twice two weeks apart and then repeated every six months. So people would get 2,000 milligrams and then six months later get another 2,000 milligrams divided into two 1,000 milligram doses. Although people with rheumatoid arthritis don't necessarily need long-term treatment like people with MS may need. Also, after six months, often people receiving rituximab have zero B lymphocytes. So do you really need to give two separate doses? What exactly is the point of the second dose? And so people have given lower doses of rituximab, 1,000 milligrams every six months, 500 milligrams every six months, or even giving the dose less often to reduce the risk. I have patients that have been treated for a prolonged period, and I'm giving them 500 milligrams of rituximab once a year, and many of them are very stable. But anyways, the dose and the regimen and the frequency may matter just as much as the drug. Now let's look at some of the prior data in clinical trials of these two 
two drugs. We'll start with data in relapsing MS. This is the OPERA 1 and 2 trials, and this is Ocrevus versus Rebif. So Ocrevus not versus placebo, but versus another active drug. Rebif is a lower efficacy disease-modifying therapy, interferon beta 1A, that we know is better than placebo, but not as effective as Ocrevus. And I won't show all the data. This is the data on disability progression. So this means someone is worse and they have a greater level of disability and they're re-examined at a later point and they still haven't improved to baseline, suggesting it's a true progression of disability. And Ocrevus was more effective than Rebif at reducing disability progression by 35.6%. And that's versus an active comparator. So against placebo, it would likely be even more effective. And let's compare that to rituximab in relapsing MS. And this is the Hermes trial. Now keep in mind, there's no pharmaceutical company pushing this. This is an independently funded study. You can see first author, Dr. Stephen Hauser from University of California, San Francisco, and my former fellowship mentor, Dr. Annetta Langergould, also on the paper. So you can see where my background is coming from. This is rituximab versus placebo. And interestingly, they did not give a follow-up dose. So it's a 48-week study or almost one-year study, and they gave rituximab one gram IV twice, two weeks apart, so a total of 2,000 milligrams. But after six months, they didn't give another dose. I'm not exactly sure why. And you can see about 20% had relapses. On the right side is rituximab getting rituximab versus 40% getting placebo. So it was a 49% reduction in relapses. Now, 20% having relapses on rituximab seems high, but they didn't give the second dose, so maybe it wasn't effective the whole time. But anyway, these are the results. Next, we move to the data on progressive MS. This is the oratorio trial Ocrevus versus placebo in primary progressive multiple sclerosis, and the outcome is disability progression. So this is the percentage of people who worsened, who had progression of disability. You can see Ocrevus in the blue line a little bit less than placebo in the gray line, a small but real and statistically significant difference, a 24% reduction in disability progression. This is a similar trial, rituximab in primary progressive MS, the Olympus trial, rituximab versus placebo, you can see people getting rituximab had a little bit less disability progression by 22%, but it was not statistically significant, p-value 0.14, though the sample size was a little bit smaller. Also, people in the Olympus trial were a little bit older on average and had a lower probability of having gadolinium-enhancing lesions, so they weren't as good candidates for the treatment, arguably. If you allow me to cherry-pick a little bit. This is a subgroup, people less than age 50 with at least one gadolinium enhancing or active lesion. And you can see rituximab blows placebo away with way, way less disability progression, 67% less disability progression. So rituximab looks good in younger people with active lesions. So now I'll show you the observational study I mentioned at the beginning of the video. Of course, the best way to compare two drugs is to do a head-to-head -head randomized trial, randomize people to one drug or the other, blind them so they don't know what they're getting, and observe them and see which one does better in real life. But in lieu of that, you can do an observational study, which is this study published in JAMA. And of course, it's not random who gets rituximab and Ocrevus. Certain types of people might have more access to resources, be more likely to seek out a certain drug, but you can do propensity matching, as is done in this study, to try to correct for some of those factors. So they had 710 people treated with Ocrevus, getting the standard dose, 300 milligrams times two, two weeks apart, and then 600 every six months, versus 186 getting rituximab, getting different doses, but most common commonly 500 milligrams or 1,000 milligrams every six months, but with some other variations. The source of the data is from two registries, MS Base and the Danish MS Registry, and the time period is January 2015 to March 2021. And as I mentioned, they use regression analysis to correct for certain factors such as age, sex, duration of MS, level of disability as measured by the EDSS score, number of relapses in the last 12 months, number of prior disease modifying therapies, burden of MRI lesions, and country of origin.
This flow chart shows you that a lot of people who received these drugs didn't end up in the analysis. So there were 6,027 patients who received either of these two drugs, rituximab or Ocrevus, in the two databases. However, a ton were excluded, 4,414, for various reasons, either insufficient time on treatment or follow-up. People with progressive MS, this was a purely relapsing MS study. People who didn't have good baseline follow-up. And people treated with stronger drugs such as Lymtrata, hematopoietic stem cell transplant, for example. And then even at the end, you can see they had to exclude some people because they did pairwise matching one to six, six times as many people getting Ocrevus as rituximab. And so some people got excluded even if they met the inclusion criteria. And of course, there could be a biases in the type of people who had insufficient follow-up, for example. These are the baseline characteristics of the people in the study prior to propensity matching, just to give you a sense of who was in the study. So mostly females, about 70%. You can see rituximab in the right column, Ocrevus on the left-hand column, but there were some imbalances. So people who were getting rituximab tended to be a little bit more disabled, EDSS of 3.5 versus 3, tended to have more recent relapses, 0.7 per year versus 0.5 in the last 12 months on average, and they tended to have a little bit more progression recently, 16% versus 12%, for example, and tended to receive more prior disease-modifying therapies prior to being on rituximab. And so there were some imbalances, but after propensity matching, they made it equal. And you can see now all the numbers are essentially the same and the baseline characteristics match up. So the propensity matching worked. Is this the same as a randomized trial? Of course not, there could be other biases, but it's as good as it gets with this type of observational study. But anyway, let's move to the results. And this is the key result where there was a significant difference between Ocrevus and rituximab. This is the rate of having relapses, the cumulative probability of having a relapse over the course of the study. You can see people getting rituximab in blue had more relapses than people getting Ocrevus in yellow. The annualized relapse rate, relapses per person per year, was 0.2 with rituximab, meaning about one relapse per five years on average, versus 0.09 with Ocrevus, or roughly one relapse per 10 years, or a difference of about one relapse per 10 years between the two drugs, which may not seem like a lot, but it's actually comparable to the results in other head-to-head -head trials where one drug is superior to another. Now, one thing to note is that the actual number of people who got either of these drugs for the full three years was pretty low. You can see only nine people out of 186 actually had data on three years of rituximab. So at the end of the study, take this with a grain of salt. Also, roughly 60% of people getting rituximab having a relapse at some point is a little bit difficult to believe. It's just not that common for people w taking rituximab with relapsing MS to have clear relapses. But even in the middle of the chart, with a significant number of people getting Ocrevus and rituximab, 345 and 92 respectively, there's a clear split between the two drugs. But I have to say, even the annualized relapse rate of 0.2 seems fairly high and is actually comparable to the results of lower efficacy medications in randomized trials. And frankly, I find it a little bit hard to believe because it's just not consistent with my clinical experience. People with MS taking rituximab just aren't having that many relapses. And other observational studies suggest a low rate of relapses in people taking rituximab. For instance, this is a Swedish observational study and people taking rituximab had an annualized relapse rate of only 0.44, roughly one-fifth of the 0.2 level I just showed you a moment ago, and in fact less than the relapse rate reported with Ocrevus. Now granted, I am cherry picking here as there are various observational studies reporting widely different rates of relapses in people taking rituximab, some of which are somewhat higher. But anyway, let's move to some of the other results of the JAMA observational study. This is cumulative disability progression. You can see people getting rituximab in blue versus Ocrevus 
Crocovis in yellow, people with disability worsening. You can see they're about the same. They crisscross each other a little bit. Again, at the end of the study, very few people left by the end of two years, so take it with a grain of salt. And there were no statistically significant differences and relatively low rates of disability progression over this short period of time, roughly one-tenth of people having disability progression over the study. For disability improvement, there were no statistically significant differences. You can see they're very close to each other throughout the study, and Ucrevis surges at the end, but there are so few people left in the study that it wasn't enough to make a statistically significant difference. And of course, there can be major biases in who's left at the end of two years. They also looked at drug persistence, the tendency to stay on treatment, and people with Ocrevus tended to stay on it much more than people taking rituximab, the blue line, as you can see. However, the authors say only nine people actually stopped rituximab due to poor tolerance of the drug, and the authors think that when Ocrevus was FDA approved in 2017, a lot of people switched to Ocrevus maybe due to payers for that reason, and so it's not necessarily a more well-tolerated drug. There is some other data on this topic. For instance, this is a small observational study, much smaller than the one I just showed you. 46 people getting Ocrevus versus 49 receiving rituximab. And this is interesting because it's actually in primary progressive multiple sclerosis. They had a mean follow-up, which was pretty short, only 18.3 months or about a year and a half. Now they noted there were a lot of imbalances and there was no propensity matching in this study. And people receiving rituximab tended to be more disabled. They had a higher baseline EDSS, expanded disability status score, a measure of disability in MS research, a longer disease duration and a history of more prior disease-modifying therapies, so they may have been worse candidates for the drug. So 15, or 30.6%, had disability progression in people getting rituximab versus a little bit less, 11 people or 23.9% that had disability worsening with Ocrevus, although this was not a statistically significant difference and it could be explained by the difference in baseline characteristics. They also looked at serum neurofilament light chain, which is a measure of breakdown of central nervous system components, sort of a biomarker in MS research. It doesn't mean much in an individual person because there's a lot of variability, but on average, sometimes it does correlate with disability progression, and there were no differences between the two groups. Another thing I want to bring up is that it doesn't really make sense that we need stronger, better B-cell depleting drugs because the actual trend in the field is to be more conservative and use them less aggressively. For instance, a lot of people during the COVID-19 pandemic held drugs like Ocrevus and Rituximab due to fear of getting severe COVID-19. And there's a lot of observational data that they did well despite that. For instance, this is a study looking at Ocrevus given in the standard way every six months or extended interval dosing giving it less often. And here you're looking at NIDA3, no evidence of disease activity 3, meaning no relapses, no new MRI lesions, no disability progression. And you can see the standard dose in dark actually did worse with fewer people people achieving NIDA3 than extended interval dosing. So this idea you must get Ocrevus every six months is quite dubious. Also in the same study they showed lower rates of decreased immunoglobin M, one of the immunoglobins that is potentially associated with risk of infection, although the level of immunoglobin G is actually more important. Not shown here is data on rituximab, again showing that extended interval dosing may be just as effective with lower risk. And if you're not convinced one way or the other, which I'm not, we will get better data fairly soon, is there are actually two ongoing randomized controlled trials comparing Ucrevus and rituximab. This one is in Denmark. It looks at active multiple sclerosis, age 18 to 65. It's a two-year study, and the primary outcome is the percentage of people without new or enlarging T2 lesions on brain MRI starting at month six. So there can be a therapeutic lag. They're giving people a little bit of leeway at the beginning of the study. It takes a little bit of time for these drugs to be effective, perhaps around six weeks to two months. Another study 
in France, also in relapsing MS, is a two-year study, so we'll learn more fairly soon. And I'd like to know your thoughts. Do you think Ucrevus is better than rituximab based on this observational data, or do you think they're equal, or is it undetermined there's insufficient evidence and my skepticism is reasonable? I apologize if this video was a little bit biased, but at least I gave you warning up front. And if you've taken Ucrevus or rituximab, let me know your experiences. Do these drugs work for you? Have you had side effects? And give me ideas for future videos.